Hello, and welcome to Physical Attraction, where we're continuing our epic series on the history of the quest for nuclear fusion. This episode is called Kinky and Unstable. A quick recap over what's happened so far. It was realised by Rutherford and his gold foil experiment that nuclei were a thing, and scientists then discovered that nuclear reactions were responsible for transmuting elements into each other. In doing so, they were able to solve all manner of incredible problems that were simply intractable without that information. They now... <laughs> they now had a theory that explained radioactive decay, alpha and beta decay, as changes that took place to constituent elements of the nucleus. They also fulfilled the dream of the alchemists and people like Isaac Newton, who had spent years attempting to unlock the secret of how to turn one element into another. Unfortunately, turning lead into gold, while it can potentially be done, is not especially practical. It was realised through developments that led to the semi-empirical mass formula that some nuclei were more stable than others, explaining the number, distribution and charges on the elements that had been discovered, and hence that some could release energy by splitting apart in fission, and others could release energy by joining together in fusion. Rutherford first postulated, and Bethel worked out in detail, that the stars were powered by the nuclear fusion of light elements, and then Bethel and others used that discovery of fission to detonate the first atomic bomb. It was in that Manhattan Project era that the race to make fusion happen on Earth began in earnest. First, Edward Teller maniacally pursued explosive nuclear fusion to build an ever more powerful bomb. Then Ulam actually came up with a successful design, which used a fission bomb primary and reflected radiation, to compress a capsule of fusion fuel. Then nuclear physicists began to think about ways they might be able to harness this power in a non-destructive way. They quickly realised that doing so would require some way of holding the plasma at incredibly high pressures and temperatures, high enough to destroy any physical container. By 1951, many alternative designs had been tentatively proposed. Spitzer's Stellarator wanted to use a double eight-shaped tube surrounded by cores of wire that would result in a strong axial magnetic field that could hold the plasma in place. Some scientists were looking into a magnetic mirror that might, through a complicated arrangement of magnetic fields, reflect the plasma back and forth inside a tube. And scientists in Britain, who later spread their ideas to America, were looking into the so-called pinch phenomenon. Passing large currents through a cylinder of plasma serves to compress it, like crushing an aluminium can, with a strong pinch. This could both compress and confine the plasma if exploited correctly. These ideas more or less existed on paper, and in a few early demonstration models, until Ronald Richter and Juan Perón of Argentina made some wild claims about having already developed and discovered and invented nuclear fusion and a limitless source of clean energy. When their discoveries turned out to have little scientific merit, they won their place in the history of fusion by getting the idea into the public consciousness, and so helping those few fledgling fusion projects that existed get funding. So we resume the story with these three promising designs and some optimism. The world had gone from not knowing about nuclei to detonating atomic bombs in a few decades. Impossible things had occurred. Might it not be reasonable to expect that fusion could too? Spitzer had caught the fusion bug. When we got back to Princeton, I continued thinking about it at night when I couldn't get to sleep, he said. The Stellarator, a bendy magnetic fusion bottle, was funded after he pitched the Atomic Energy Commission, but frustratingly it was almost immediately shrouded in a veil of Cold War secrecy. Spitzer tried to persuade them that controlled fusion was unlikely to be militarily useful, but it's fair to point out that the high-energy neutrons released when nuclei fuse could technically be used to make weapons-grade uranium out of less enriched uranium, so it's not entirely true that fusion technology could never be used for a military purpose. But this secrecy would hamper the initial efforts to recruit scientists into the field. How could you set about looking for collaborators if you couldn't tell anyone what you were working on? The secrecy also led to some pretty unusual arrangements. You could hardly build a vast secret lab in the middle of campus and expect it to remain secret. So Spitzer was given a building five miles from Princeton's main campus that had originally been used as a rabbit hutch for animal research. There, Spitzer jury-rigged the first stellarator. It was made of a glass pipe, a small vacuum system to pump the air out of it, a heating source, and a simple coil of wire as an electromagnet. The glass pipe was two inches wide and around 12 feet long, suspended from the ceiling by wire. The heating and the magnetic field were provided by coils of wire wrapped around the tube by hand. The whole thing was powered by an ordinary 220 volt socket in the wall. In other words, it looked like the kind of thing you'd find in Doc Brown's lab in Back to the Future. Hansen quotes Joe Centeri, a young electrician who was hired to work on this top secret experiment. 
You're wondering what it was, and then when you go in there, a 2x4 rack with some pipes, these receptacle switches, nothing. It just looked like a kid made it. Very unimpressive. I didn't realise what it was going to come to. End quote. Yet in this strange, jury-rig contraption, Spitzer was working with a mysterious substance, one that made up most of the matter in the universe from the interiors of stars to the matter in the interstellar medium between them, but only occasionally and briefly sparked into life, on Earth, in lightning bolts. In that sense, it was a pretty remarkable endeavour. The important thing to remember about a plasma is that it's not just a lump of stuff that reacts to externally imposed magnetic fields. A plasma is made of ions and electrons, it's made of charged particles. In fact, the term plasma, coined by Irving Langmuir, refers to the way that blood plasma carried around red and white blood cells, in the same way as physical plasma carries around different particles like high-energy electrons, molecules, ions, and impurities. The way the plasma interacts with the magnetic field you use to confine it is important, sure, but the way it interacts with itself is even more important. It gives rise to an entire field of study, known as magnetohydrodynamics, where you have to combine the equations that tell us how fluids flow with the equations that tell us how electric and magnetic fields are generated. Plasmas can carry waves due to these charged particles oscillating. The oscillations of one charged particle pull on another, and cause it to move in turn. Bear in mind, though, that just knowing the equations isn't enough. There are, for example, the equations of fluid dynamics, of temperature, of thermodynamics. Even though we know these equa equations, they can still have behaviour that makes the weather inherently impossible to predict beyond a certain range, due to chaos theory. What's more, at this point in history, there were virtually no experimental results to look at. Plasma does not exist naturally on Earth under normal conditions. The closest we get is lightning, which is a kind of partially ionised plasma. There's plenty up in the interstellar medium, although far too cool and sparse for fusion, and there's also plenty in the heart of stars, but both of those sets are rather hard to examine. No one had ever built a container for plasma. No one had ever heated it to near fusion temperatures. This was totally unexplored territory, except on paper. And even then, without experiment, there was no way to confirm current plasma theory, which would eventually turn out to be a horrible oversimplification. Magnetohydrodynamics is as complicated as the name suggests, and could give rise to all kinds of incredibly fascinating behaviour. Sadly though, not all of this behaviour is particularly conducive to getting plasma to behave the way you want it to, and getting nuclear fusion to work. Rivalries began almost immediately about which of the designs would be most successful. In fact, Spitzer, who favoured the donut-shaped Stellarator, actually spent part of his grant money trying to prove that the pinch idea, which in the US was called the Perhapsitron by James Tuck, wouldn't work so easily. It turns out that they were right. So what was the problem with the pinchy Perhapsitron? As usual, problems started to arise when things got too kinky. The idea is that you have a nice, perfect cylinder of plasma, and that, by passing a current through it, you get a nice radial compression that can contain and heat the plasma so that it fuses. The only problem is that this is an inherently unstable system. Like a ball sat on the top of a pointy hill, it's mathematically stable for one point only, but the slightest instability grows just as the ball will rapidly roll downhill. It turns out that if you have a tiny kink in that perfect cylinder, the magnetic fields generated by the pinching current tend to expand the kink. What you ha essentially have is a kind of density gradient up. There's more magnetic field in one area than another, and some charged particles are pushed more than others. They respond by moving away, and if they move in a way that only increases the magnetic field gradient, the instability will expand. Naturally, this effect gets bigger as the kink gets more pronounced, so you have a runaway, accelerating instability. The plasma tube will rapidly go from being straight to wobbly, and then finally break apart altogether. The whole process, from the initial formation of the kink to the plasma hitting the sides of your container, takes on the order of a microsecond. If you even get fusion going, it won't be for anywhere near long enough to generate useful power. You could perhaps just have long enough to snap a few high-speed photos of the plasma wriggling and writhing like a snake before the instability destroys your nice tube of plasma. This was what was found when the Perhapsitron was first constructed by Tuck, with help from others, like our old friend Ulan, in 1953. And in many ways, this sets up the story for so much of the fusion endeavour to come. Someone will come up with a design that solves a problem. It seems like it should work on paper. But then, when the theoretical calculations are done in detail, or when the device is actually built, some instability that hadn't been considered comes to light, and renders the idea impractical. Then, you either have to try and compensate for that instability with a more complicated design, or abandon the whole idea and think of some other way of getting towards fusion. A great deal of the history of these nuclear fusion efforts can be described as very clever theorists and experimentalists having their efforts foiled by the intricate complexities 
of how plasma can behave in electromagnetic fields. Just a year later, in 1954, our old friend Dr. Strangelove, I mean, sorry, Edward Teller, pointed out another kind of instability that would plague early types of stellarators. In fact, this instability was discovered by Carl Schwarzschild, the grandson of the man who had first solved Einstein's equations of general relativity, and first mathematically discovered the black holes, and Martin Kruskal, who made immense contributions to many fields in mathematics and physics. As scientists and theorists began to look in more detail as to how plasmas might behave under a range of different conditions to solve this practical problem of getting fusion to work, they were beginning to discover the immense complexity of the field and the way things could go wrong when you tried to get the plasma to behave. This particular instability is sometimes called the interchange instability. Recall that the stellarator uses magnetic fields generated by coils of wire wrapped around a figure 8 tube. Inside the tube you have magnetic fields due to the coils of wire, but also they run through the plasma itself. It turns out that sometimes, when a magnetic field has a particular curvature, it's preferable for the plasma to swap places with the empty space containing the magnetic field. This actually doesn't result in a change of shape for the magnetic field as a whole, which means that you don't change the energy in the system associated with the magnetic field. But instead you change other forms of energy, for example gravitational potential energy. If the magnetic field doesn't care about the plasma drifting down due to gravity, then it's energetically favourable for the plasma to do just that. But then this means that the plasma isn't uniform anymore. And so, because your plasma is no longer uniform, there are forces due to the plasma interacting with itself, you have a perturbation, you have a little change that can grow and expand, and eventually your plasma becomes unstable and can't be contained by the magnetic field anymore. The real problem here was the initial optimistic calculations about the types of devices that could get fusion to work. They had made some pretty simplifying assumptions. Basically that you could treat the plasma as a collection of independent electrical particles that obeyed simple Maxwell equations, rather than the strange, broiling, unstable, turbulent fluid. Teller's analogy for this was saying that the magnetic field holding the plasma was a little bit like rubber bands trying to hold jelly together. As they squeeze the jelly, they try to snap inwards and let the plasma leak between them. It actually turns out that the interchange instability hadn't been noticed by the scientists working on early stellarators. They had other, far bigger instabilities to deal with. This, of course, is the issue. If you solve the instability that, that if you solve the instability that destroys your plasma in one microsecond, it might just allow you to watch some new instability that takes ten microseconds tear the plasma apart. At this stage of fusion development, plasma diagnostics—the ability to actually measure the properties of confined plasmas, their shape, their temperature, their density—was still extremely rudimentary. Early stellarators were suffering from slightly more mundane problems though, I mean, in the early Earth models the plasma couldn't even be heated to high enough temperatures. The magnets tended to move around when they were operating at maximum capacity, destroying any hope of stability with the now changing magnetic field, causing all these perturbations that would kick the plasma out. Impurities in the plasma resulted in it emitting huge amounts of X-ray radiation, which caused it to rapidly cool down before it could hope to reach fusion temperatures. The solution, in each case, and for every kind of researcher, was to build a slightly larger device, or one with some additional complexities in the magnetic field, designed to smooth out the instabilities that had just been discovered. Between 1953 and 1957, the Model A stellarator, the Model B stellarator, the B1, the B2, the B64, the B65, and the B66 were all successive models of the stellarator that were built. Each one was larger and usually more complex than the previous one and each one demonstrated some incremental improvement or other in the confinement time, or in the heating of plasma, or in its behaviour. There were all kinds of different problems and parameters to tweak with the Stellarator that complicated the simple design that Spitzer had come up with on his ski lift. You'll remember that this design was a figure eight because of the problem of drift in a normal donut-shaped fusion container. The wires that wrap around the donut are bunched up on the inside compared to the outside, and so the field is stronger towards the centre of the donut, which caused charged particles to drift towards the edges. The ions and the electrons would drift apart, and strong field gradients would tear the plasma apart. The figure 8 is supposed to cancel this drift because the particles are travelling clockwise and anticlockwise for different sections of the track. But it's impossible to have this figure 8 precisely crossing itself, otherwise you'll just end up with two columns of plasma smashing into each other, and you're not building a collider here. So there was some residual drift that still happened in the figure 8 stellarator. Designs experimented with trying to get the configuration closer to a figure eight. For example, 
flattering out the tube into a racetrack configuration. Unfortunately, the magnetic field is not the only source of drift for the particles to crash into the walls. You also need to worry about diffusion, the natural tendency for particles when they collide to spread outwards through collisions and interactions with each other. Previous calculations suggested that this would be a tiny effect compared to the magnetic field gradient, but theorists, notably Bohm, pointed out that diffusion in plasmas is more complicated. Classically, we think of diffusion in terms of particles bumping into each other, colliding, and interacting. Imagine having a gas of atoms that's doing just that. Over time, the gas will gradually spread out, like when you spray a deodorant in the corner of a room. Collisions in dense regions of gas will be more than in sparse regions, which allows the atoms towards the edges to wander out more freely than those at the centre. The result is something like a random walk. If you take a step in a random direction, and then turn around and take another step in a random direction, and so on, eventually you do drift away from where you started. But plasmas are different. Their particles don't just move according to the velocity distribution, like free atoms in a gas, but under the influence of magnetic and electrical fields. The result is that diffusion in plasmas wasn't well understood, and if it turned out to increase the more you tried to confine the plasma, for example, this could be a deal breaker. After all, if diffusion was, say, proportional to the magnetic field, when you tried to confine the plasma for longer using stronger magnetic fields, you would have more diffusion, so you could end up reaching a limit beyond which the plasma simply can't be confined. And there are still other problems. We talked about how the Lorentz force on a charged particle, the force it feels due to magnetic fields, is the charge times V cross B, which means that it's perpendicular to its velocity and the magnetic field, and proportional to both. But this means that if you have plasma ions and electrons with substantially different velocities, then they'll feel a different force. They'll also be travelling at different rates, because they have different speeds, and so they'll be accelerated at different rates around the figure 8. Particles that are travelling too quickly might smash into the walls of the stellarator. Those that are travelling too slowly might not be confined at all, with weak magnetic forces that act on them, and drift on a large, lazy orbit into the walls of the stellarator. The result of this is that you enhance instabilities and you lose plasma. It's not good for confinement, and it's not good for fusion. Spitzer and others try to fix this using a diverter, essentially a region that would select the particles with the appropriate velocities and send the rest away. But if you're losing too much plasma, you're not going to get ideal fusion conditions. If you're losing the fastest ions and electrons, for example, you're losing a lot of the energy that's generated by fusion, and a lot of the energy that's generated by your heating mechanism. So it all makes fusion more difficult to achieve. So the early 1950s in general turned out to be an era where early experiments and theoretical calculations demonstrated that this magnetically confined fusion business was going to be far more complicated than anyone thought. The complex interactions between magnetic and electric fields, plasma charged particles colliding with each other and drifting due to their insanely high temperatures and pressures, the fluid dynamics and the turbulence of moving plasma. All of this gives rise to a rich array of incredibly complex, beautiful and fascinating behaviour, but also painful instabilities that ruined early fusion reactors. The $50,000 budgets for initial research projects were ballooning into tens of millions of dollars. The ambition grew ever wilder, but results would have to wait for the next generation of machines. Ultimately though, these early devices struggled. Not only was confining the plasma an incredible challenge all by itself, but attaining the necessary heat and pressure for you to even begin dreaming of fusion was not easy. For example, the B1 machine was only heating plasma to around 100,000 Kelvin, compared to the 50 million Kelvin that Fermi had calculated would be necessary for a self-sustaining fusion reaction in the deuterium-tritium fuel. Confining the plasma for a few milliseconds was hard enough, but it wasn't even at fusion temperatures yet. The Stellarator, at least in the US, was thought to be the most promising concept after early calculations and experiments had shown there was this kink instability in pinch devices. The UK was still focusing on pinch devices, of which more later. Yet, in 1955, scientists working on the pinch project at Los Alamo in the US had something to show for their efforts. A key point to understand here is that nuclear fusion can occur between plenty of different light nuclei and types of fuels. We know that all kinds of fusion processes can take place in heavy stars, but there the energy requirement is not as limiting as it is in our experimental fusion reactors. The nuclear fusion that everyone is trying to achieve at this stage is deuterium-tritium fusion. Deuterium is a proton and a neutron, and tritium is a proton with two neutrons, so they're both heavy forms of hydrogen. You might intuitively expect that this will be a fairly good target reaction for fusion, 
because after all, what makes fusion so difficult? The answer is protons repelling each other. So getting some light nuclei with a nice high number of neutrons compared to protons should mean that you have a decent shot at getting fusion at fairly low temperatures. The strong force will take over at a slightly further distance, so you need slightly less energy because you don't have to push them together as much, and fusion is slightly more likely. And indeed this is the case. Deuterium-tritium reactions are still favoured by experimental reactors today, with a large cross-section, that is likelihood to interact, and a lower temperature than other reactions. The reaction between deuterium and tritium is fairly simple. A proton and a neutron meet a proton and two neutrons. The result is helium-4, a nice stable isotope of helium that we all know and love, and a single leftover neutron. The energy that's released due to the rearrangement of nuclei in one of these reactions, which is around 17.6 mega electron volts, mostly ends up as kinetic energy in that neutron. So, if you're really getting nuclear fusion to work, the sign will be lots of very fast neutrons, which aren't deflected at all by the magnetic fields in the bottle, so tend to just whiz out of the reactor, emerging from the plasma and smashing into your detectors. Neutrons, as a sign that fusion reactions are taking place, are very important beasts. That is why, in early 1955, when scientists at Los Alamo built yet another large pinch machine, and switching it on, they found neutrons emerging, it caused a great deal of excitement. It looked like they had made that crucial first step, getting nuclear fusion reactions going on Earth in steady conditions. It seemed like a quiet breakthrough. The machine, the Columbus One, named after another famed pioneer, may have just stumbled upon a way of getting fusion to work on Earth. And a few years later, the results were repeated in Britain by a much smaller experiment. Was this the start of a successful fusion project? We'll pick up the story there next episode. Until then, you've been listening to Physical Attraction. You can find us on the web at www.physicspodcast.com, where you'll find the contact form. Anything there, any comments, questions, concerns, all go straight through to my email. So give us a buzz there if you like what we do, if you don't like what we do, if you'd like us to do something else, all kinds of different things. You can leave us a review on iTunes. That's always very helpful for helping new listeners to find the show. Same is true of Stitcher or indeed wherever else you get the podcasts. If you're on social media, why don't you tweet at us, PhysicsPod? You can retweet our latest episode. Helping people find out about the show is always a really great thing to do if you want to help support us. And, of course, you can tell people in person. You know, just leave episodes of the show on USB sticks or CDs in their office, home, under the bed. Until next time, then, take care of each other, and don't build any nuclear fusion reactors that I wouldn't build.